with a broad range of government and non-government and private organisations. His skills and expertise have seen him work with organisations across Australia and also overseas, including Columbia University in New York, as well as in France and also New Zealand. Anthony holds expert knowledge in both qualitative and quantitative research methodologies. He is a much sought after facilitator and has delivered over 90 opening speeches at conferences, 150 conference papers and over a thousand professional development programs. Anthony has an exceptional capacity to challenge organisation, organisations and people to reflect on how their approaches to communication, leadership, diversity, values, relationships and workplace culture affect their services, businesses and ultimately the community. Anthony is currently com completing his PhD at Macquarie University and his PhD is a study on the nexus between leadership and courage. Cybernetic organisms, what can early childhood educators learn from cyborgs and Daft Punk? <laughs> First, I have to thank Lisa. That was that was amazing. Thank you so much. I got like the worst job, like after Lisa. Um, yeah, that was really powerful. Thanks, Lisa um, and Leanne. Um, thank you for today. It's, we 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 got this email, or some of us got phone calls saying, "Talk about whatever you want." Now, how dangerous to say to people, "Talk about whatever you want," um, coupled with and, and be um, like we're not all crazy. But we were told to be controversial. So please don't walk away and go, they've just found the craziest people on the planet. <laughs> and, and gave them a mic. Um, so for many of us, our, these are the things that we have been thinking about. Uh, and so when given a platform to talk, we, we do. I, I want to talk about us being in body, relational, fractured, contested, and misunderstood human beings. And I, I do want to thank, and I, it is important to thank, many of the women who I have worked with. Leanne was my first boss um, uh, when I worked at Ella in Haberfield. And I think some people are here from me. I think everybody's worked at Ella in Haberfield. <laughs> they don't have side, half side, high staff turnover, but many of us have worked there. So um, it's been around for a while. It's been a long time. We're very young. Um, but we do stand on the shoulders of great women. And this is not to put men down. But look, as a man, I don't need someone to tell me I'm great because I get those messages all the time from the world. Seriously, it's not because of who I am. Many of us get those messages. And so I think there is a lot to be said in rejoicing in what this sector has achieved. Um, but there's also a lot to be said in, about, in thinking about what is and what can be. And I hope this is what we get out of today. So I want you to do a bit of an experimental study. Can you put your hand? Because this is like what they call this the graveyard shift. Like if you've got carbocitis, like you've just eaten the sandwiches, you, you want to sleep, so I'm not going to let you do that. I'm just trying to help my mate Liam out by keeping you all awake. Um, can you put your hand in your pocket or your bag, grab your phone and give it to some random person in the room? <laughs> in your screens. Got a new iPhone 5. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, 
actually some of us are going, look at their screensaver. Um, <laughs> but there is, I mean, you, we always have to work with respect. So we, let's be respectful about having other people's phones. But if a really hot message comes through from like their lover, can you please read it out loud? That would be, really, be quite a lot of fun. Well, for me, anyway, because I haven't handed my phone to anyone. <laughs> And I just want you to sit with that phone for a while and I'll explain what we're doing. So this presentation is an argument for pleasure and confusion of boundaries and for responsibility in the construction of this confusion. And I, I mean, I, my, my, my friend Lisa and I do talk very early in the morning. The only person who texts me at 5am on a Saturday is Lisa as we start to plot deviant behaviour. Um, you know, and she'll send me a message, have you read The Australian? Um, no, it's 4.55 in the morning. So. <laughs> or even worse, I'm in Perth. It's 2.30 a.m. <laughs> but there is something to be said about crossing boundaries. And I hope today has done that. And I'm going to support this, I hope. But I want us to take some wise words from uh, Nicholas Rose, who says that we need to be critical. And we need to be very critical about those things that are given to us as if they were timeless, as if they were neutral, and as if they were unquestionable. And we need to stand against the current of received wisdom. And he suggests to us that it's introducing a kind of awkwardness into our own experience, of interrupting the fluency of that narrative, and to encode our own experience, and to make the story stutter. I mean, if you... I mean, historic words like this make me want to go back and be a director and share this with staff to say, this is where reflection happens. If you can start to ask yourself questions that are so disturbing that your story starts to start, that you become awkward, and we've had many awkward moments today, haven't we? <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, I think I have to swear to be part of the gang up here. <laughs> I can't even bring myself to that, and I am usually colourful in language. But you have to feel okay to be awkward. We do this to children all the time. We challenge children with silly things like go and say sorry to your friend, where we know that the staff room is the hive of bitchiness sometimes. <laughs> no one follows the grievance procedure to go and talk to the person who made them sad. <laughs> you don't want to be invited to lunch with that colleague you've just had an argument with, yet we invite children to go and sit together and play. So let's rise to this challenge and not dismiss an awkwardness into our own experience. And we do talk often about the image of the child. But I wonder what the image of us is and how we may have contributed to this and if there is some benefit in blurring that. Because remember that our identity has not just been constructed by others, but it's maintained by ourselves. We choose to maintain a particular kind of image. And I, I, you know, I was walking to the bathroom and for all these important local government manager people. Um, I wonder what they think we're talking about. Do they really know what's happening next door? I bet they had no idea. Which is kind of fun. It's kind of fun to know that really uh, you know, destructive practices are happening around us. But we also need to know how can I mobilise a particular kind of identity that not only undermines us but helps us move forward. So what are the issues? And like Lisa, I don't have an evidence base to this other than people have been talking to us for many years. People say that things are being done to us. That only happens when you allow people to do that to you, though. I'm hearing that the same issues recur over and over again. And, you know, I, I, I've had the great pleasure of once being a staff member at Community Childcare, but being on the board of Community Childcare, and I, I think... Um, the issues that we struggle with then are still the same. The issues don't change. I'm hearing that some of our advocacy attempts uh, have not always worked, yet we have had some successes. I hear that we want change. I'm also hearing that we need change. What I'm also hearing is that innovation and its definition is becoming very limited. Uh, um, look, some of our staff at Samantha that we don't, have never worked in early childhood and when we get excited about innovation, we sometimes get these blank faces saying, that's innovation. <laughs> and I don't take that personally, I think about that. 
I think deeply about how we define it uh, and how it looks like in practice. But the other scary, or the most scary thing, is that the operational manual of practice is well and truly alive. Uh, I, I do want to put it out there. I am, because I can be misunderstood as we all can, I am a great fan of the regulatory framework. I'm a great fan of the EWF, and I'm a great fan of the National Quality Standard. I am not a fan of every child in this country being reduced to the same five outcomes. Because we were never asked to do that. No one ever asked us to do that. But I think out of fear we do that. I had the great pleasure in being in a remote community, Aboriginal community, um, I don't know, it all blows in, somewhere between 1974 and last week. <laughs> um, about 14 hours north of Perth, and I, I walked into this Indigenous program, and there were outcomes being mapped together, outcomes pre planned for children to be benchmarked against. And I said, But no one's ever asked you to do that. And how can a child in a remote Indigenous community have the same aspirational outcomes as a child in Ultima? And I think that doesn't come because we feel we're hard done by or someone has told us or we're scared. Or, or, or we're scared. I think it comes because we doubt ourselves. As Lee said, we doubt our intelligence to speak up or actually to know the facts. And when you don't have the facts, you do listen to hearsay. And I remember being at one of the a director's meetings where someone, this is a long time ago, and someone said, oh, do you know you have to have two locks on your medicine cover? And I thought, shit, I can't even find the first key. <laughs> the second kid. And you know, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I have to go past somewhere to grab another lock on the way. I'm thinking, come on, where is that in the regs? And when you stop and you read, you know, it's not there. So what are we scared of? So what's going on? And I, I want you to think about this as we walk meander for the next couple of months. Let me ask you this. What's a cyborg? And if you're a sci-fi person, it's okay to out yourself. <laughs> What's a cyborg? It's generated with all the things Yes, a <laughs> And you know what? She didn't check Google because she's got someone else's phone. <laughs> she's not using anyone's data plan, so... Yeah. So what you see up here is a cyborg. A cyborg in short, is a cybernetic organism. It is um, a being that has an organic but a cybernetic part. It's both hybrid of a machine and an organism. And something tends to happen to cyborgs, and that is they are controlled by something else. And my main argument today is that we need to reconnect with our heart as much as we do with our head. I've been working with leaders for quite a long time, both in studies but also just in professional development. And I've realised it's very safe to live in your head. It's very easy and protective to talk facts to people. Numbers, and jumping board sizes, and performance appraisals and all that kind of stuff. Because it protects us. It protects us from having to connect with people. But to allow ourselves to connect deeply with people to reconnect with the organism in us, the human part of who we are, I think is something that's diminishing over time. Because we have multiple selves. You have your first self, your second self, your third self might be you as an early childhood educator. You might have a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. You know, how you are behaving now, and I hope, and I'm sure the Anne hopes, is not how you behave when the, co the cocktail starts flowing. <laughs> I hope that if you stumble out of here drunk at whatever time, you won't drive number one. And if your friend vomits, you pull their hair back. <laughs> That's what good friends do to say. But you don't continue to behave like an early child educator on a Saturday night. We know, you know, we, we use our, our lovely voice. We get down to children at work and you can control 15 and you go home and you lose the plot with one. <laughs> and you say to yourself, how? Do I just have a monster? <laughs> or am I a cyborg? Has, is there something controlling who I am that says to me, this is the manual of operation, and this is how I should behave? So if you start to think about your first self, uh, you might be a friend, your second self, you might be a parent, your third self, you might be an educator, your fourth self, you might be the woman next door, the fifth self, you might be a best friend, and it goes on and on and on. <coughs> 
What we don't want is to become this. We don't want, and these are, we all need phones, I get it. We all need these documents, I get it. But we cannot become these documents. I was doing a talk the other day in Melbourne, and it was such a lovely thing. I was talking to a group of uh, directors, and um, a woman said, we talk about quality improvement plans and, and how they are spaces for innovation. They're not meant to suffocate. And this woman said, you know, I love my quip. And everyone's like, shocked, how can you love a quip? I was supposed to, that's wrong. And she said, I'm not using the prescribed form. You don't have to. No, we're actually given a license to be different. And I said, so what are you doing? And she said, well, I spoke to my staff. And I said to them, what is the best way to reflect how great you are? And she acknowledged, and they acknowledged that for some people, the written word is not their strength. And so they created this ongoing narrative on the wall, a story of sorts, out of pictures and photos, poetry, words, things they had made of where they are now against each quality area and where they want to be. It spans down the corridor, around, into one of the rooms, and it goes on. Parents are contributing. She said, that is our quality improvement. And everyone's going, and as you know, the first question was, are you allowed to do that? <laughs> and I just, and I, and I stopped and I said, so, I said, I love that you said, are you allowed to do that? I said, who wrote your quip? And she said, oh, I did. And you know, I kind of feel sorry for me, which I'm not very good at doing. And I turned to the woman who did this, and I said, who wrote your quip? She has about 23 educators, about 40 families, and a whole heap of children. I thought, well, there you go. You know, it was so innovative. And what she was doing was resisting this normalisation. She took the requirement to reflect quality, but she chose to do it in context for her community. So I'm going to suggest to you that we are all an integrated circuit. And this is what we need to do, as Haraway says. If we learn how to read these webs of power, and social life, we might learn new couplings, new coalitions. If you recognise that your identity is bound by things like people's expectations, like Lisa said, the voice in your head, the this, the that, this document, we begin to realise that we are a circuit and that we're not as free as we think we are. But one thing that we can do is have a reintegration. I can choose and we can choose how we come to see ourselves. Because the saddest thing about this whole narrative I hope I'm weaving for you is, at the heart of early childhood is diversity and difference, is that total respect for difference. And what we've been doing and the journey we've been going on for many years is sameness, that I need to look like you and you need to look like me. If you don't take 200 photos of children a day with a digital camera, then you're not good enough. And it's like, well, hold on. And I was in a centre the other day and it was like a breakdown. I thought a child's arm got chopped off. And someone said, there's no batteries in the digital camera. <laughs> and so they couldn't do the program. And I, 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 and I was there to watch and give feedback. And I just said to her, I said, what did you do before that camera? And she, you know, there was a smile on her. And I'm not arguing against the camera. That's not what I'm doing. She had a smile on her face. She said, well, we kind of talked to families. <laughs> we wrote a couple of notes. And then we said to families, come and talk to us if you want more information. And it was as if she had reintegrated her circuit. She was free from this thing that she thought she had to do. And when she pulled it apart, and I said to her, so when the camera is, does have a battery, will you use it again? She goes, yeah, but I won't be so committed to it. I won't feel like I have to do X amount and print so many. So we need a rewriting, I think, of who we are, and a rewriting of our practice, because the cyborg experience is about the power to survive, not on the basis of original innocence, but on the basis of seizing the tools to mark the world that mark them as other. Furthermore, the aim of a cyborg is to subvert command and control, even if it is that voice in your head that's commanding and controlling you. And as Haraway says, the liberation rests on the construction of consciousness, the imaginative apprehension of oppression, and so of possibility. So could this be a calling for radical activism, a breakaway of sorts?
dare we dance to a different beat, even though we're told we should be doing this? So our journey as cyborgs, half who I am and half who I think I should be, half me, half the quip, half this, half the minutes from the last meeting, could the journey be one of transgressing boundaries, of potent fusions, of dangerous possibilities which progressive people might explore as part of our need for political work? Because I'd like to suggest we could hardly hope for anything more powerful than resistance. So dramatic at the back. <laughs> if you are interested, this is a two-hour movie by Duff Punk, a cyborg who resists and quite sadly kills himself. But I don't want to show you that part. <laughs> so, what might be the ideal early childhood cyborg if we could reintegrate and rewire ourselves? What might what might that look like? As Haraway says, the cyborg politic insists on noise and advocate pollution. We rejoice in illegitimate. Fusions. And we are reminded that we did not originally choose to be a cyborg. So perhaps what we need is profound transgression. And in saying that, you know, I, I do love those early morning phone calls, Lisa, where we start to plot things. As Leanne Gibbs says, whatever you want, whatever you want to get, whether you want to get involved in something small or something big, the important thing is that you remember you are entitled to fight for the things that you believe in. And this comes from that great book about advocacy in early childhood. So perhaps there's a need for civil resistance. Power concedes nothing, and it will never. Find out, to find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you've found out um, the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those who may oppress them. So perhaps we need a rising up in early childhood, and I'm not asking for violence or anarchy, but Gandhi talks about non-violent weapons. Because we know about the dynamics of resistance. When people derive, deprive an oppressor of their consent, it reduces, it reduces its legitimacy. When enough people refuse to cooperate, they increase the cost of holding control. When the system's legitimacy drops and the cost rises, it enforces doubt in its endurance. So perhaps we can consider the following. We need to recast our idea of power. We should never see ourselves as powerless. And we should never use that kind of language. We need to create spaces to resist like today. We need to recast a new discourse around early childhood and who we are. We need to be able to persuade, not coerce people. We need to occupy a space of self-rule. We need to listen, delegate, and invite people to participate. And some words from a very wise woman. There's no room for sugar coating. I'm a badass and I like it. <laughs> I just checked it this morning, Lisa. That was a 5.15 a.m. text on, <laughs> on, a, on a Sunday morning. So I want to leave you with this. A pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. Thank you, community child. Very happy birthday.